This is the outline of my talk. I will um, actually talk quite a bit about polio because that's what we do for a living. And then uh, go on to uh, detail some new molecular approaches that we're using to ident detect and identify polio, non polio enteroviruses from environmental surveillance and how significant is this aspect uh, for the completion of polio eradication. So I will also uh, touch on uh, circulation of patterns of non-poly enteroviruses uh, with potential to cause neurological disease as from this uh, environmental surveillance uh, analysis and uh, discuss an upsurge of AFM cases. This accounts for acute flaxseed myelitis that have occurred between August and December 2018, mainly described in the USA and the UK which are uh, most likely associated with enterovirus infection. So just a very quick introduction of uh, NIBSC, uh, the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control. We apparently produce uh, more than 90% of the international uh, standards for uh, biological medicine, so that's our main business. But uh, we've been involved in the WHO Global Polio Education for many years, even before it started. And we actually are a global uh, specialized polar laboratory dealing with surveillance and a collaborative center for reference and research on polymelitis, one of the few in the world that deals with uh, vaccine development and also improving uh, surveillance systems. So as, as we discussed during yesterday's sessions, uh, the new polio-like disease emerged or hit the news last, especially last year as uh, there were a number of cases in many of the U.S. states uh, of AFM possibly caused by enterovirus infection. The same thing happened in the U.K. where there was a report of a significant increase in AFM cases from what we normally see around less than five cases a year, so there was 40 in this period. Of course, if we turn the clock back 100 years, this was probably what happened with polyvirus, although, of course, uh, in that case, it was at a much larger scale. So again, uh, it, there was a new disease that they didn't know what they came from, uh, but of course, it took a while to identify that there was a virus. There, there were no cell culture systems. There was not uh, much known about viruses, so that was actually a fasc fascinating story. But of course, uh, scientists figure out what was causing this disease, and they developed vaccines that were very efficient against polio, and then th this is when uh, the polio eradication started. So polio eradication, uh, as you're probably all aware, uh, went very quickly. So the virus was eliminated from most of the regions, uh, as I said, very quickly after the introduction of vaccines. But the last cases, the last end game for, for eradication is, is becoming very challenging. And uh, this is, I think, especially because of the inability to deliver vaccine to some places uh, where the, uh, there are very many difficulties to do that. But also uh, for the fact that the main vaccine that has been used for eradication is the live attenuated vaccine can revert to uh, wild type properties and cause outbreaks in certain conditions, particularly when there is no uh, high immunity in the population. So as you see the map here, only two, three, it's actually two, Afghanistan and, and Pakistan remain uh, endemic for polyovirus. Although C, BDPV, uh, circulating vaccine, the polyvirus outbreaks are, are being described in different places. This is the current map of the cases cases, you can see in red the uh, cases uh, derived from wild type, but uh, CVDPVs of all three serotypes are currently causing outbreaks, which is quite worrying. In fact, uh, I think this will require the introduction of new vaccines, and there is a very active research program in developing new OPV, again, uh, led by uh, Andy McCann at NIBSC in collaboration with the University of San Francisco, CDC, and funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In fact, as we speak, some of these vaccines are being tried in clinical trials. Uh, so uh, another problem with uh, challenge for the polio eradication is the existence of uh, immunodeficient patients that can excrete vaccine that are polyvirus for many years. 
We have an example in the UK, which is the world record, and is currently uh, known to have been excreting bugs in the right polyvirus for more than 30 years. Here we show the three attempts to interrupt the replication of this virus in this patient that were unsuccessful. This one actually reduced the level of virus quite significantly, but the virus came back, as they do, and we is back to current levels. The last sample we have is from a few months ago, still positive for polyvirus. And you have to realize this is a type 2 virus that's equi equivalent to a wild type 2, which actually has been officially eradicated. So. Uh, the availability of all these samples, of course, we are virologists, they gave us a lot, an opportunity to study the replication of uh, saving two for uh, long term in this patient, and we found interesting findings that uh, the virus seems to replicate independently in different sites of the gut, leading to uh, separate lineages that can be replicated separately for uh, up to 10 years. Uh, those lineages eventually can recombine between them and uh, one of them disappears, and again, after uh, a few years, they again diverge again, recreating uh, two different lineages. We also study the possible impact of the treatments on the population diversity on the left bottom there, and it seems that at least the first treatment with uh, antibody uh, led to changes in population but did not get rid of the virus. So this virus the viruses uh, shed by this, this patient are very, very virulent. They're comparable to wild type or CVDPVs and also contain a, a high antigenic change uh, difference uh, from Sabin 2. So this is uh, an anti uh, reactivity with antibodies, uh, type 2 antibodies, black means react. So this is the reactivity of uh, a number of wild type antibodies isolated for a period of 40 years. You can see that they actually retain most of the antigenic characteristic of saving 2 uh, This is a CVDPV. But uh, isolates from these patients have lost their activity against most of the anti uh, antibodies uh, directed against different antigenic sites. Despite that, and sorry, this is a quite a complicated slide, but this is just showing the neutralization titers of human sera. These are well immunized individuals against saving 2 MEF1, which is the virus used for IPV, and the, uh, these IVDPV strains. You can see the, there is actually no significant difference in the neutralization against these three strains. So we can say that we are still protected against uh, viruses shed by this patient, despite the extens extensive antigenic changes. So how common is this problem? Uh, we don't know, but... Uh, at least we know that viruses of similar properties that those described uh, from this patient have been isolated in, in those countries, in the switch of those countries. So definitely there are set, some uh, people excreting this kind of viruses probably everywhere in the world. Uh, so the, the, the previous slide highlights the importance of environmental surveillance. All those uh, viruses were found uh, in environmental surveillance, of course, in the absence of a paralytic case, uh, you don't investigate for the presence of a uh, virus, unless there are some studies looking at uh, IV, IV immunodeficient people uh, looking at is, if they are excreting uh, polio, but otherwise you would miss those uh, excretors. This happened in Israel. In fact, uh, Israel uh, used uh, IPV inactivated polyvaccine, which is efficient at preventing the disease, but not at preventing transmission. So polio can still transmit to some level uh, with, uh, from these, these immunized individuals. Uh, of course, trans virus will be transmitted, but disease will not happen or will happen at a much lower rate. So uh, obviously through acute flaxseed paralysis surveillance, you will again miss transmission of this virus. So in this case, environmental surveillance, which was conducted routinely in, in Israel, uh, detected the circulation of a, a wild type 1 virus derived from uh, Pakistan in, throughout the country. And in fact, uh, there was a need to reintroduce OPV to stop this outbreak. No polio uh, cases happened. 
This highlights the importance of environmental surveillance, which is being used everywhere and is actually uh, going to be expanded to uh, different countries uh, to make sure we complete the job and we can certify uh, the, the world from uh, polio-free. Uh, again, uh, there is a very good correlation between viruses found in sewage and in, in uh, cases, as you can see here, in uh, an example in Pakistan. And of course, uh, we wanted to implement this in the UK. As you can see on the left, uh, this is not really a new idea. This is a newspaper cut from more than 60 years ago, advocating finding polio in flies and sewage. I mean, flies, maybe not a good idea now, but sewage, it is. So we've done this in the UK. The process is actually to collect the sewage, concentrate, and uh, analyze, at the moment, uh, cell culture is, is required following that sequencing, and this is a similar process than that uh, followed from stool samples. Uh, but of course, we want to uh, develop a direct detection method, otherwise uh, it will take about a up to a month to make sure a, a sample is negative for polyovirus. So we, we, what we've done is develop a number of uh, PCR uh, reactions that uh, produce products that will be an, an, was, are analyzed by uh, next generation sequencing. With, uh, uh, hope, uh, we hope that this would lead to a much better and sensitive uh, way to detect polio and non polyvirus in the sewage. And that includes the VP1, which is the, the, actually the sequence of the most exposed capsid protein that is normally used for phylogenetic studies. A PANI VPCR that uh, is able to amplify the whole capsid region of all enteroviruses, and uh, PAMPV that will amplify the whole genome, or random PCR that uh, might be use, useful in some cases because uh, it will retrieve all sequences present in that sample regardless of the sequence. Another uh, protocol we use uh, to increase the sensitivity for detection in sewage is to use a nested PCR first with a PANIV and then a specific VP1 PCR using parameters specific for the zero type of interest. So we conduct a routine surveillance for polyvirus in the UK, and this actually is uh, quite important to maintain uh, the our polio free status as far as WHO is concerned. So we have two sites in Glasgow that collect monthly samples, and one site in London. This is the catchment areas of the sites. And uh, we have collected uh, samples in, in Scotland from 2014 and in London from 2016. Uh, in that case, four samples have been positive for polio, and in, in this case, three samples have been positive for polio. In all cases, uh, those viruses have been vaccine-like, and uh, they probably come from people traveling to areas where vaccine is still used. But uh, we are confident that uh, we have a sensitive enough method to detect uh, polyvirus in sewage, and should circulation happen, we believe that uh, we will, will be able to detect that. So uh, applying the new, this new met methodology I mentioned, we use next generation sequencing to characterize viruses from positive uh, cultures. You can see mixtures of enterovirus growing there including the polyvirus, which is actually in quite a small quantity with respect to the other viruses. So we could use also specific polio primers to increase the, the, the sequence reads for polio if necessary. So with this, we, we, we can characterize the viruses. In this case, uh, most of the type 3 viruses uh, have been shown to be recombinant, which is uh, normal, which is known. But we can do this quite easily with NGS. And uh, of course, the aim, uh, as I mentioned before, is to uh, establish a method that allows the direct detection of human enteroviruses in environmental samples, both polio and non-polio. So human enterovirus uh, can be divided in four species from A to D, and as you can see here, they can cause or are associated with a wide range of different uh, syndromes, from respiratory disease to hepatitis, myocarditis, um, paralytic disease. There are four uh, serotypes from all these four species can be involved in different syndromes. And these are uh, more than about 110 serotypes have been described so far. So we use this PANIV whole capsid system to 
first we uh, characterize the, the method by uh, looking at a number of clinical uh, samples kindly provided by from PHC Collindale, and we tested uh, our PANIV NGS method versus the uh, current routine WHO typing method, and we found actually it was as good or better uh, being able to detect extra uh, number of, of uh, type extra number of enteroviruses and, and also detect uh, samples containing more, more than one enterovirus. So we applied this method, uh, sorry, this is, uh, we actually were able to de uh, detect many different serotypes, including D6, uh, there are D68 and uh, recent respiratory C viruses, 105, 104. So the, the method seems to work with all known uh, enterovirus serotypes. So we applied this technology to uh, detect enterovirus serotypes directly from uh, sewage concentrates. You can see here, the composition of different samples. Each, each one of them represents the enterovirus content in what is the equivalent of one milliliter of raw sewage. So you can see uh, samples from Scotland and England having these ones a slightly higher number of different serotypes. We did that in Nigeria as well. Uh, so samples from Nigeria contain a wide variety of different enteroviruses depending on location and time. And if we look at a typical sample from uh, London here, showing about 25 different serotypes versus a sample from Pakistan, showing many more. In fact, this shows 60 different serotypes in a single milliliter of raw sewage, which I think is quite amazing. Uh, if you remember yesterday, uh, in Heli Harvala's talk, she mentioned that 66 different serotypes were found uh, during three years in 24 European countries, and here you have 60 different ones out of the known 110 in a single aliquot of a single sample from, from sewage. So sewage enterovirus strains are uh, an accurate uh, representation of a clinical uh, virus, viruses found in clinical samples. You can see here again, a single sample of sewage contains 60% uh, of the viruses that are detected annually through AFP in, in, in Senegal or Scotland there. But you can see that in Scotland, uh, a lot of the reads correspond to clinical stains, whereas uh, not in, in Senegal. This suggests that uh, maybe surveillance is not so efficient here, or there are a lot of enterovirus circulating, not causing any disease at all. Again, the, the, the merit of direct detection versus using cell culture systems, you could detect many more serotypes that will not grow in culture. All will be outgrown, outgrown by different serotypes. For example, in RD cell culture, which is the cell culture used in polio labs, uh, enterovirus B viruses seem to grow much better than other species. So, despite the high con proportion of reads mapping to A or Cs here, only B viruses were detected from RD cell cultures. So now go to the, back to the beginning of my talk and talk a little bit about the acute fluxing myelitis and uh, possible EV infection association. So I need to read this. So uh, a high proportion of, of patients uh, with AFM uh, describe preceding viral symptoms, uh, usually respiratory infections one to two weeks before the onset. In fact, more than 90% in, in the most recent outbreak. Symptoms include fever, uh, rhinorrhea, cough, vomiting, or diarrhea. Onset of weakness is very quick, within hours to a few days. Weakness is uh, in one or more limbs. In fact, in the, in the UK, uh, it affects the four limbs in, in quite a number of cases, or, and may be accompanied by a stiff neck, headache, or pain in the affected limbs and it predominantly uh, affects the gray matter. So what is the evidence of uh, association with enterovirus infection? Enterovirus D68, in fact, was first described in 1962, but uh, only from 2010 seems that large increases uh, in the incidence of severe, severe respiratory illness due to uh, D68 were described. In 2014, the USA experienced a nationwide outbreak of uh, enterovirus D68 associated with res severe respiratory illness 
and there were 120 AFM cases. Outbreaks of AFM have occurred over two years in the USA, with 149 cases in 2016, 228 cases in 2018, and very few cases in between in 2015 and 2017. In Europe, 4 and 29 AFM cases with associated EVD68 infection were reported in 2004 and 2016, respectively. In the UK, a substantial increase uh, from uh, less than five AFM cases annually to 40 in 2018 were reported in association with an upsurge of enterovirus D68 detections, with similar increases in D68 detection in other European countries, but, but no AFP cases reported. So in terms of the 2018 outbreak, uh, 80 confirmed AFP cases were analyzed for the presence of enterovirus D68 in the USA, and 14 were found to contain uh, EVD68, only one in CSF. Uh, but again, a large proportion, relatively large proportion of them contain EV71, another virus, enterovirus that has been associated with neurological disease. Other enteroviruses, rhinoviruses 13. In the case of the UK, uh, EVD68 in nine out of 40, and other enteroviruses, six. I think the association in terms of uh, timing of EVD68 outbreaks of circulation, uh, I think is quite overwhelming. You can see the association of AFM with the detection of enterovirus D68. So that's quite good evidence of association. Although in 2016, it is claimed that not so much respiratory disease happened associated with the 68 but still the, the, the data we have matches with the IFM uh, timing. Again, this is the data from the UK uh, published by PHE. You can see here the columns represent uh, cases and the line represent a detection of EVD68. So again, very good matching. So we thought uh, that we, we, it would be a good idea to check our environmental uh, surveillance samples for the presence of enterovirus D68. It is claimed that D68 is hardly uh, isolated from stool samples, but we find it actually in a lot in sewage. You can see also uh, the timing of the finding in sewage, uh, both from Glasgow and London, correlates very well with uh, the findings, both in clinical cases from England and Wales. You can see there, maybe the Scotland being slightly before that in London. Of course, uh, during that time, uh, this is uh, enteroviruses found during a, a one year period. You can see uh, this is up to 60 different serotypes found, and uh, there are different patterns or for different serotypes. Some of them, ma many of them are actually found throughout the period with some holes here and there but some others only found in short periods of time suggesting possible outbreaks like D68 here. In terms of the genetic properties, the, again, very close match between viruses found in sewage and virus found in clinical samples. So in 2014, we only had one sample, but it was uh, one of these serotypes, sorry, genotypes. In 2015, we found uh, both B2 and uh, B3. In, two in 2016, we found both uh, B3 and D, sorry, here, A2 or D, which is the same. Uh, in 2017, very little uh, enterovirus D68, but the one we found was D, similar to one here. And in 2018, both uh, B3 and D clays were identified. So very accurate representation of what is actually circulating. When we compare the sequence, again, this confirms the close uh, relationship between the, so the dots will represent switch isolates and the branches clinical isolates, very close uh, match between strains found in switch and in clinical samples. Similar uh, findings we have for other uh, serotypes. This is for an example of Coxsackie A6 that is also being uh, very prevalent, as you can see in switch, we have representatives of most of the genotypes 
found in clinical cases. Uh, okay, so it, it seems that there's been an increase in, 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 in incidence of D68 since uh, 2010, perhaps, 2009. Uh, we, this is uh, analysis of very few uh, serum that we have uh, uh, in the lab, uh, but at least it shows that these sera from uh, US, different parts of the world, actually contain quite a high level of antibodies against two strains. One is uh, 1962, the first one isolated, and another one that was associated with the 2014 outbreak. Uh, this is interesting, perhaps, that this sera from the UK, which is actually from uh, NANGS, is used in an international standard, had a quite a high neutralization title against the 1962 strain, suggesting that uh, infection was quite prevalent even at that time. In any case, uh, if results from uh, Peter Simmons yesterday suggest that a uh, change in incidence on, uh, of EVD68 infections uh, from pre, uh, between 2006 to 2016, so pre-emergence, after emergence of uh, cases given, producing AFM. What is the molecular basis for uh, EV68 phenotype change? We don't know. Uh, there is an increase, an apparent increase in transmission, an apparent in increase in uh, neurotropism, which might, not, might just be the consequence of uh, higher uh, infection. Uh, we don't know. Changes in antigenic properties, changes in binding receptor usage, the different uh, hypotheses can be made, but we don't know the answer. What we know is that uh, although F these green uh, arrows show AFM cases have only been found in B3 and B1 uh, clades, uh, viruses with neurotropic uh, properties and able to paralyze mice ha have been found from different clades. So it seems that neurotropism is not a newly acquired property of EVD68. So, uh, more, more research needs to be done to find out the reasons for this change in phenotype. And you saw that um, some of the cases in the US, at least, uh, uh, were associated with infection with enterovirus A71. So, enterovirus EV71 mostly causes very severe outbreaks in the Asia Pacific region. There are some examples of outbreaks here. And this is the different genome groups that have been circulating with mostly C4 and B5 being present now. Uh, viruses of the C1 and 2 also uh, circulate in Europe, but they don't seem to cause uh, such severe outbreaks. So the, the normal uh, manifestation of intervirus 71 is uh, HFMD, but uh, as discussed in previous sessions, they can also produce neurological disease from uh, uh, meningitis, encephalitis, paralysis, etc. And uh, we don't understand why uh, this is mainly mainly occurs in in Asia Pacific region. Uh, one possibility is that the viruses only circulate there or mostly circulate there. But uh, we have seen uh, the viruses in Europe and in other parts. Uh, again, we decided to test some of the samples we have from Pakistan, because in Pakistan, uh, obviously, there is an interest of finding polio. And we use those samples to check for intervirus 71 and our Coxsackie A16, which is another uh, virus causing large outbreaks of HFMD in Asia Pacific region. So, there are very few records of HFMD in Pakistan. There are actually no Coxsackie virus A16 and A71 A70, A71 described there, despite being one of the countries where mo a lot of surveillance is carried. So we tested nine samples from uh, 2015 and 28 samples from 2017 for the presence of these two serotypes. And we found actually a lot of these viruses there, 70%, 73% of samples were positive for Coxsackie A16, and 64.9 were positive for Enterovirus 71 in different areas of the country. And when we analyze the sequence, uh, these are the phylogenetic analysis of both 
uh, we actually identify new groups, genogroups, very different from anything that had been discussed before, particularly from Coxsackie A16 here, genogroup E, and for uh, Enterar 71 genogroup H. You can also see there is quite a lot of diversity within those genogroups suggesting uh, a long-term replication of those uh, genome groups in those country, in these countries. Uh, when we look at the evolutionary history of these viruses, we can see that, uh, for example, the intervirus 71 is uh, distantly related to viruses in India, but seem to have been circulating in, in Pakistan for a long time. And this one actually uh, in Coxsackie 16 is only similar to a virus isolated in 1951. So it seems that it has to be has circulated independently from any other genome group found elsewhere in the world for a very long time. Okay, so the conclusions is that uh, direct NGS analysis based on PANIV PCR products can provide whole capsid genome sequences of complex intervirus mixtures, including previously unidentified serotypes and novel genotypes. I, I, I have not told you that in, in, mo in many of the samples we analyze we actually identify enteroviruses that have been described very few times, uh, some of them only uh, with only one sequence previously available. Environmental surveillance provides a sensitive system to detect enterovirus circulation, particularly useful in areas with suboptimal enterovirus surveillance, and can be used to detect and follow up enterovirus outbreaks. Environmental samples contain an accurate representation of enterovirus strains associated with clinical syndromes. There is good temporal and genetic correlation between enterovirus D68 detection in sewage and identification in clinical samples. Enterovirus D68 is likely responsible for AFM cases detected since 2014. However, other enterovirus infection or um, any other unidentified factors might also contribute to the development of AFM. And the molecular basis of EV68 phenotypic change leading to increased enterovirus D68 incidence and AFM is unknown. And high prevalence and diversity of new uh, Coxsackie A16 and enterovirus 71 genome groups silently circulating in Pakistan have been identified in the sewage and in the absence of reported HFMD cases. And hopefully, I've shown you that uh, with this approaches, we are uh, maybe uh, starting to see a bit more of the hidden part of the enterovirus iceberg. These are all the people uh, contributing to this work, the first ones doing the, the work, and some other collaborators, Heli and, and Peter, uh, help us uh, accessing the samples from Scotland, switch, uh, good collaboration with PHE and CDC and also with uh, the group of Nick Grassley at Imperial College. And part of this work funded by the Mil uh, Bill and Melinda Gelbuch Foundation. Thank you.